now we will get on to our eighth part, our eighth part, the purpose, the purpose of the church, the purpose of the church. And seeing as how we talked about last time we were together, the purpose of time, uh, well, let's talk about how we spend our time, right? We spend our time coming to church. So what is the purpose of the church? Well, there are a couple uh, real easy verses that I'll give you as by way of introduction that give us a nice picture of what people did or what people should do in the church. Primarily, if you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, interestingly, just prior to this, in verse 41, uh, 3,000 souls were saved and they were added to the church, and now this is talking about what they did. And very simply, it looks to me that they, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, so what it was they, they taught, and fellowship, they were together, they were breaking bread, and they were praying. Pretty simple, right? Uh, if we talk about the purpose of the church, this is what they did. Now, I've given us three points, essentially. Three things that I think conclude with what the purpose of the church is. So write these three things down. First of all, to exalt God. To exalt God. Uh, secondly, to equip the people. To equip the people. And thirdly, to evangelize the world. To evangelize the world. So to exalt God, equip the people, and evangelize the world. I think these are our three primary objectives or responsibilities as the church. So let's talk first of all about this uh, first thing, exalting God. Exalting God. Uh, now first of all, this is the idea that the church, the church is created essentially to give God the glory. To give God the glory. Now I've given us a couple, three things here that we can do in order to give God the glory. Because as a church, when we gather together corporately, and by the way, that's what I'm talking about, the, the local church, not necessarily the universal church, which every person who has trusted Christ is placed into the body of believers. We're talking about the corporate gathering, the local assembly. There are essentially three things that we can do to exalt God as we come together and we gather as we gather corporately. Uh, here they are. First of all, exalting God happens when we give God the credit. We give God the credit. We must, as a church, give God the credit for all the good that's done and give Him none of the blame for all the bad. Now, interestingly, this is what happens. We essentially give God the blame for all the bad things that happen. Why did God do this? And we take all the credit for all the good. We are, in a sense, the self-made man, the self-made woman, right? We are the people who are getting it done. I read a quote the other day that said, while other people were dreaming about it, I was out getting it done. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of neat. Now, the irony is, is there are some motivated people, but we still have to give God the credit. This is God's doing. He is the one that supplies all of our needs. He is the one that should get all the credit for all the good. Now, this is opposite of the culture, of course. The culture says it was me. I did it. It's interesting how, how fast we can take the credit for something that's accomplished. The good is all us. The bad is all God, right? That's, no, it's not right. All the good is God's doing. And all the bad is our doing. And we would all learn from M.R. Dahan who said this. He said, if we would talk more about the Lord and praise Him, we would have less time to talk about ourselves. Ironically, this is what we do. We go around and we talk so much about ourselves, what we've accomplished, what we want to do, and, and our goals, and what, what we have done in the past, as opposed to saying, no, this is what God has done. Praise God. God is good. In 1 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, Sing unto Him, sing psalms unto Him, talk ye of all His wonderful works. His wondrous works. This is something that God has done. God is the, the creator. He is the divine author. He is the author and finisher of our faith. It's not us. It's not me. It's Him. And so oftentimes we look to ourselves and we give us the credit. We give us the props for all the things that we have. And then when tragedy strikes, and then when our world gets flipped upside down, when we don't have the things that we should have, when we become broken, and God takes something from us, 
then we begin to place blame on him. I think this is one of the reason why one of the reasons why God uses the people he does. I think God chooses, he selects people he's going to use to do certain work. I think this is very intentional. I don't think this is accidental. I don't think God in heaven is sitting around going, oh, I, why did I choose that guy? I think he knows exactly the people he wants to use to accomplish his perfect will. And matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says it very clearly, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now that's interesting. That God is not choosing the upper echelon of nobility. He's not choosing the, the, the people who we would think he would choose. Like, why, why do we say to ourselves, I mean, you ever, you ever walk around and say, well, why is it, why is it that God hasn't, has, hasn't really got a hold of somebody who has, who has a lot of money and can contribute a lot to the church? It's interesting, my kids, they, they wrote letters to Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and, uh, and, and uh, Warren Buffett the other day. And now, we haven't heard anything back. I'll let you know. <laughs> Believe me, I'll let you. I'll call everyone individually. And uh, now, why hasn't God chosen some of these people to do His ministry? Well, why why aren't there just wealthy people that could that could just write a check for fifty million dollars and give it to Northside Baptist Church, and we could take care of all of our needs forever, right? Well, here He says that. He has not called many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Here's who he has chosen. Listen to this. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Now, isn't that interesting? Totally contrary to what we think he should have done. And he goes on to say this, and he's chosen the base things of this world and the things which are despised Hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are? Why would God do that? Well, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now that's pretty profound. The reason that God chooses the people he does to accomplish his will is because he doesn't want anybody saying, I did it. How can a person exalt God? How does a church exalt God? They exalt God by giving God the credit. Giving God the credit for what He has done, not what I have done. This church is not a product of me. This church is a product of God. God did this. God is building the church. Now that's wonderful. You know if the church fails, that's not God's fault, that's my fault. And that's the right perspective. That's the right perspective. So we exalt God by giving God the credit. I think that's primary. Secondly, we, we exalt God by being a distinct people. By being a distinct people group. Uh, th this, this is just wonderful. This has to do with being set apart for God's work. You realize that God has, has called us, has called the Christians, the body of believers, to be a distinct people group for Him. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Listen to this verse, 1 Peter, 15 and, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Here's what that means. The word holy means to be set apart. We are called to be set apart for God. We're not to be like the world. We're not to be like the unbelievers. You know, ironically, what you'll find is you'll find the church, the church needs to be distinct. It needs to be separate from the world. But the church tries to emulate the world. Now get that. The church tries so hard to be like the people they're not supposed to be like. And when you go into churches, oftentimes, they try so hard to, to reproduce synthetically what the world is doing organically. They're just out there and they are just being themselves and then we as a church are trying to model that. Now can you imagine that, right? I have been to some churches. I've been to some churches. I got, I got saved when I was, um, I was 17 years old. First church I ever went to was Evergreen Community Church. It was a, the umbrella was, the name of the church was The Rock. <laughs> now that's interesting, right? I mean, you want to talk rock music? 
I mean, I remember just, just recently being saved, sitting back. I was in a church, or not a church, in a, in a uh, school auditorium. And I watched, the, the, this was back in 19, that's way back, isn't it? 1998-ish. And I remember watching what they were doing, the music that they played, the light show that they had. And I remember as a young convert, as a new believer, as a new Christian, I, saying to myself, something's wrong with this. Now, I had recently been saved, and I could, I could identify that, that that probably is not right. That looks exactly, well, not exactly. They, they, they don't do it as well as the world, by the way. The world does rock music way better than the church, so when people come in and, and they, they are enamored because of the music that the church plays, uh, eventually they're going to go out and they're going to find it find someone who can do it real well. Just saying. They do it better than us. But God has called us to be set apart, set aside, set. We're supposed to be different than them. Now listen, you know as well as I do, you only want what you don't have. So if the church is acting so much like the world, and the world looks at the church and says, I already have that. We're not enticing them at all. It's when they come over here and they say, you know, I knew something was different. Your speech was different. You, you, you are, you, your, your songs are different. Your attitude is different. Your perspective is different. I want that. We don't want what we have. We want what we don't have. And so we have been called out to be different from them. I think one of the ways that we exalt God is by being a distinct people, set apart, separate from the world. God has called us this way. And thirdly, we exalt God by giving Him the preeminence. Preeminence. That's giving him the first. Giving him the best. Giving him, giving him the, the, the first right of refusal, so to speak. Saying, Lord, I am going to give you the, the first part of my day and I'm going to give you the most of the first part. We exalt God. We worship. We, in, we, we, we glorify God when we say, Lord, we're going to give you the very, very first part. Not the last part. Not the crumbs or the crumblings. We're not going to say when we get to the end, oh, Lord, we didn't have enough for you. We're going to say, I'm going to cut you a sliver right now. You ever, you ever get that? You ever get the first, the first uh, bite of the, of the pie? The, fir- the best? I, we, I was over at Max's house. He makes a killer rhubarb, by the way. I mean, and, and I, I had a pretty good sized sliver, okay? He was giving me the preeminence, and I thank you for that. But I'm telling you what, when, we get the fir- when, when you give God the first part of the pie, and you give him the biggest part, when you pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, when you meditate day and night, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, when we are saying, Lord, we're going to meditate day and night, we're going to pray without ceasing, we are going to give you more than a tithe, which is just 10%, by the way. So you say, I'm going I'm to put more on top of that. When we give God the, the most and the best of what we have, that is what pleases God. That glorifies God, by the way. When we give Him preeminence, we give him first place. You ever let somebody cut in line? And you say, hey, come up here. You can stand right here. You have given them preeminence. And when we do that for God, that exalts God. That glorifies him. And we need to do that more. Psalm 150, verse 6 says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. We should be doing this all the time. And the way we do this is by giving Him preeminence, by being a distinct people separate from the world, and giving Him the credit for all the good that He's done. These are just three ways. So first of all, we look at exalting God. Secondly, we look at equip the people. The church, the purpose of the church is to equip the people. This deals with discipleship, by the way. Uh, this, is, um, this deals with discipleship. This is part of the Great Commission. Discipleship is part of the Great Commission. It is not the Great Commission in, in, in total. It is, it is part of the Great Commission. Matter of fact, Matthew 28, 20 says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We need to teach people what we've learned. That's what this is saying. Teach others what it is 
they've been taught. Discipleship is about that. Let me ask you a question. What are you telling others about what you've learned? What are you telling others about what you've learned? Are you discipling people? Now notice this verse teaching them to observe all things. And I think there's some confusion in the church today on what true discipleship is. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But we need to be equipping. Equipping is giving others what they need to do the job they've been called to do. That's what equipping is. When you give someone the equipment to do the job, that's what we're doing. Now you can be a carpenter, listen carefully, you can be a carpenter without tools. You can be a carpenter without tools, but you're not going to be a very good one. You need to have the right tools to do the job you've been called to do. And if a carpenter is only as good as his equipment, then we've got to make sure that he has the right equipment. And a Christian is only going to be as good as his instruction. We have to make sure that the Christian has the right instruction to do the job they've been called to do. So we have to equip them. The purpose of the church is to give the instruction that brings a person from spiritual infancy to spiritual adolescence. It takes them from where they, where, they, where they are when they trust Christ as their Savior, and it brings them to maturity. This is the purpose of the church. This is why God gave the church certain people. Look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. He gave this group of people, gave some of them, listen, why? Here's why. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. The purpose is to equip them. To perfect them. The pastors, the teachers, these people are, are there in the church to help equip the saints. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He goes on to say this that we henceforth be no more children. So to take us from our childhood to, our, to adulthood, right? That we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Here it is. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So the whole point of the church then, a point, one of the, the, the triune points, I guess I could say, is to get that person equipped for the work of the ministry. It's to bring them from spiritual childhood to spiritual adulthood. It's to bring them along a line to help them to grow up spiritually. We say this to our kids, grow up! Well, the church is there to help our children do that. It's to help spiritual infants grow up in the Lord. It's to equip them, to give them the equipment, the tools that they need in order to be spiritual. Exalt God and equip the saints. Let me give you a couple things. First of all, a note about discipleship and a warning about programs. A note about discipleship. Discipleship is more than just talking about the mercies of the Lord. Now that's good. Discipleship is more than just talking about the goodness of the Lord. Okay? There's a lot of people who say they're being discipled or say that they are discipling somebody and are not really discipling them. They are talking about portions of discipleship. But according to this scripture right here, Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, there is more than just talking about the mercies and the goodness of the Lord. Discipleship is more than just the gospel. It's more than just telling someone how to give the gospel. It's more than just telling someone how to love their neighbor. This is important. We need to love our neighbors. We need to talk to our neighbors. How many of you talk to your neighbors? I don't even talk to my neighbors, right? Discipleship is more than just teaching someone about tithing. Discipleship is more than just any one of these things. Discipleship as a whole 
is bringing a person to spiritual maturity. It's talking to them about all things that pertain to being spiritual. When you take a young convert and you just give him one thing to work on, you've imbalanced that young convert. When you give a young convert one thing and one thing only to deal with, you've given him a chance to be imbalanced. And they are going to go one way or the other way. That's why we have the whole counsel of God. That's why discipleship is to teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. A disciple is somebody who is learning all things about God and is receiving all the instruction whatsoever they've been taught. Discipleship is important that way or else you'll have an imbalance. Now let me give you a warning real quickly about programs. Programs are good. But programs are not an end in themselves. Programs are good. Programs help facilitate discipleship, but programs are not discipleship. Programs help a person be discipled, but there are a lot of people that put tremendous stock in discipleship programs. And now I call the Reformers Unanimous, our addiction program, I call it an advanced discipleship program because we talk more about uh, the, the Lord than just His goodness. We talk more about the Lord than just His mercy. We talk more than just loving your neighbor. We talk about, as a whole, how to grow up spiritually in the Lord. How to become a mature Christian. Programs are good. Programs are not going to save you, though. Programs are not the end in themselves. Programs just help us move along. If we want to get to a place that we want to be, we use a program to help us get there. But the program is not the end in themselves. They just help to impart the information. Okay, so the church so far exalts God, it equips the people, and lastly, it evangelizes the world. It evangelizes the world. This deals with the second part, the second part of the Great Commission. This deals with reaching the world. It says in um, um, sorry, Mark 16, 15, it says, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, listen carefully. Many people think that any evangelism is good enough. And any evangelism is good, but it's not good enough. We need to be evangelizing. We need to be evangelizing. But what this passage tells me, it tells me to go ye into all the world. Okay? There is more than just, well, first of all, most of us don't hand tracts out anyway, which we, we should. And then some of us think that writing a check to a missionary across the country, across the world, is, 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 is enough, which isn't, isn't enough either. Because we've missed the people next door to us, We've, 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 we've literally walked past a hundred people to write a check to somebody who then can, go, then can go spread the gospel abroad. Now that's important. But mission work, your evangelizing should not stay local. It should be global. It should only start in your front yard, but it should end on foreign soil. That's what this is saying. You're supposed to go into all the world now, a lot of us don't have the opportunity to go into all the world, so we write the check, and that's fine. But the Great Commission is to evangelize the world, to preach the gospel throughout the world, not just our community. The community is good, but we need to go further than that. We need to go further than that. And you know, I, I tell you, we, we handed out 2,500 tracks for, uh, on the 4th of July. It's wonderful. And we've, uh, we've got some missionaries that we support. We need, to, we need to put together a missionary program because I want to be more evangelistic globally. And we need to do that, and I think that that's important. But you have to have both of them. The purpose of the church is to evangelize the world, locally and globally. We have to do both of them. We are to go into all the world. This is a commandment. This, this, is, an, this is a responsibility. I say, I say it's an obligation, not an option. And you know, as when we get to Matthew chapter 9, 
we see this, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The reason the harvest is so great is because there's not enough laborers to do the job. We need more laborers in the field. We need more people who are willing who are willing to trust God with their lives and say, I, we need more missionaries. I'm just telling you, we need more missionaries. We need more, we need more church workers. That's just true. It's true. Our, our, our pastor back home, he used to say, let the world, he said, let the world provide the doctors and the lawyers. The church needs to provide the preachers and the missionaries. Because there's enough people in the world that are doing all of those things. And, and, and I tell you what, my heart just, just bleeds for laborers, co-laborers. And, and this, this church, is, this church is, 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 is I, I enjoy this ministry. I enjoy working with the team that I have. God's given me just a tremendous team. And we are all co-laborers. You are, you are co-laborers. As you sit here today and you absorb the preaching, you are part of the ministry. But, but let me just ask you a question. Have you ever thought about full-time Christian work? Have you ever thought about full-time in the ministry for the Lord? The, the, the Lord will provide, or the, you know, the world will provide the people out there to do your job in the world. But the question is, is has God called you to be full-time in the ministry? Has God called you to do mission work abroad? And friends, I, 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 I really believe that there are probably people in this very room, I believe that there are people in every church across America that God has called, and they are refusing the calling. They are refusing the calling because of fear, potentially. What they might not have if they choose that. God has called the church to evangelize the world, to equip the people and to exalt God. And... and, and I'm telling you, oftentimes we fail in at least one of these areas. The church needs to be exalting God. The church needs to be equipping the people. The church needs to be evangelizing the world. It needs to start locally, but it needs to end globally. We ought to have, we ought to have a, a unified church with this. And friends, if God is calling you into the ministry, don't kick against that. There is absolutely nothing more in this world that I love more than working in the ministry. And I work in the ministry with my best friend, my wife. I get to be with her all day long. You know how awesome that is? And my kids are here all day? I mean, what God doesn't give me in money, He makes it up in time with my family. It's marvelous. It's wonderful. We need to be evangelizing the world. And it really starts right here in this auditorium. It starts by me making sure the gospel is clear and is preached every Sunday. In just a moment, we're going to take communion. We're going to try to get it as fast as we can. I hate, to, I hate to rush communion, but I want to get it in. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you don't know where you're going when you die, I pray, dear God, that you, that you will know that you will trust Jesus Christ alone as your Savior. I want this hand right here to represent you and me. I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. God says He loves us, hates our sin. All of us have done wrong. All of us, uh, I, I think at least some point in time in our lives, ha have tried to be good in order to attain heaven. What can I do, Lord, to be good enough to get to heaven? Listen, being good is good, but being good doesn't get you to heaven. You need a Savior that pays for your sin. That's what you need. The Bible says that the wages of this sin is death. The penalty is death. It's not church membership. It's not walking an aisle or praying a prayer or giving money. It's not communion. The wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross for our sin. He made the payment for us. And he looks now on you and me as righteous as he looks upon Jesus Christ. He made the death payment. He went to the grave, rose again the third day. And now He looks at you and me as righteous as Him. 
are so marvelous. That's the message that we need to propagate throughout the world. That's the one. That's the one. That Jesus died for our sin. Did you know telling somebody that Jesus is a good guy, that Jesus is God, did you know that, that telling somebody how much Jesus has done for you is not sharing the gospel? People say, I share the gospel. They say, oh, I talk about the mercies and the, and the love of the Lord. Great. Did you tell that person that Jesus died for them? Did you tell them that? Because that's the gospel, that Jesus died, was buried, rose again the third day. That's the gospel message. If we haven't done that, we're not evangelizing. If we're not telling people how to do that, we're not equipping and if we don't do this and give God the credit, then we're not exalting. Jesus died for us. He was buried and rose again the third day. That's marvelous. You can't ask for anything better than that. You can't ask for anything more. He gave everything He has to us. He gave us His only begotten Son. And that faith alone in Jesus Christ alone gets us saved. That's our ticket to heaven. That's our ticket. It's not because we're good people, because none of us are going to be good enough. Friends, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I pray that in the quietness of your own mind, you place your faith in Him alone. That you trust Jesus Christ, that He died for your sin. He was buried and He rose again the third day. Mm -hmm.